Well, hopefully this is the last of these the basic uh, types of limits I'm going to do. I'll concentrate, I think, on some trigonometric stuff after this. So this time I think I want to do the limit of 1 over f of x is equal to 1 over the limit of f of x. But I want you to look at what we did last time. Here you'll notice that I can get a delta with f of x minus l in absolute value less than the absolute value of l of 2. But if you look at the f of x's, the f of x's go between l minus the absolute value of l over 2 and l plus the absolute value of l over 2. In fact, if l is positive, this is simply l over 2, the bottom portion of the y values. And what that means is that because l and the absolute value of l are the same because they're both positive, even if they were negative, the same kind of a thing would hold. Anyways, let's go to this theorem. If the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l, where l does not equal 0, then the limit as x goes to a of 1 over f of x equals 1 over l. So starting the proof of this, first notice what I was talking to you before, um, where how f of x is bounded. As we always do with these things, let epsilon greater than 0 be given. And the first thing I'm going to do is look at 1 over f of x minus 1 over l, in absolute value, of course. And eventually, I need to get that to be less than or equal to, to epsilon, or just less than epsilon. But I'm going to do a little algebra right now. I'm going to combine these fractions by getting the common denominator of f of x times l. All of this is an absolute value. Now I'm going to break it all up into three absolute values. L minus f of x in absolute value divided by the absolute value of f of x times the absolute value of L. Now this is where the f of x thing comes in. If you remember, I was able to get, oh well, before I get to that, all of this is less than, or I need to get this all to be less than epsilon. The whole point of, of, of writing all this is to show you how I can sort of chip away at the epsilon portion of this. And I'm going to work each of these absolute value pieces individually. So let's find a delta 1 greater than 0 so that the absolute value, well, if 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus a, which is less than delta 1, implies that the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than the absolute value of l over 2. Drawing a quick, ugly graph for the moment, there's l, that would be my target y value, there's l over 2 if L were, were positive, of course. And the top would be L plus L over 2, or 3 halves L. The Y values, or the F of X values, are going to strictly be between those two Y values, L over 2 and 3 halves L over 2. Now, if L happened to have been negative, I still have the same kind of things going on here. I can take L plus the absolute value of L over 2, I can also take L minus the absolute value of L over 2. And if my F of X values are between those, because that would be what, that's still within the absolute the distance, absolute value of L over 2 from L. Even if L were negative, once you re revert to all absolute values, I'm in the situation that we see in the top. No matter what, 
f of x, the absolute value of f of x is greater than l o absolute value of l over 2. The absolute value of f of x is greater than the absolute value of l over 2. Make sure that you get that down because what I'm going to do next is very important. Now I'm going to solve, I want to get 1 over the absolute value of f of x, which is right there. You reverse the inequality, and you get 2 over the absolute value of L. So let me go back to all that stuff I had before. I want to grab the first and last piece of these absolute values. So the absolute value of 1 over f of x minus 1 over L equals the absolute value of L minus f of x divided by the absolute value of f of x times the absolute value of L. Now I'm going to put my inequality in. I'm going to leave the L minus f of x in absolute value for a moment. I'm going to leave the absolute value of L. But the 1 over f of x, I am going to replace with 2 over the absolute value of L. Notice that's why I have the inequality now. So what I have now, if I multiply this together, this equals L minus f of x absolute value divided by the absolute value of L. Actually, I'm, I, let's rewrite that. I'm not going to multiply it again. I'll get the absolute value of L squared, and I'll get a 2 in the numerator. All right, now, if you take the absolute value of L and you square it, that's no different than L squared. So let me just throw that in there real quick. 2 over L squared, I'll put it out front just so I know what to do with it. Now, I have L minus F of X. Now, F of X is going to the number L, so... I can find me a delta 2 greater than 0, such that zero less than the absolute value of x minus a less than delta 2 implies the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than. Now, what I need to do is I need to end up with epsilon in the end, but at the same time, I got to wipe out that 2 over L squared. So the piece that I'm underlining there, that'd be nice if I can get an epsilon just in the end. And the easiest way to do it is to let the absolute value of f of x minus L be less than L squared over 2 times epsilon. So L squared over 2 times epsilon. I don't know why I did that. L squared over 2 times epsilon. And then you have the times 2 over L squared. Got it? So that leaves me with just an epsilon. Now, at some point, 